Now let's talk with Mike. Mike, thanks for being here again and Thank offering you. that challenging message for us. Happy to be here. It, it brought to mind for me, when you talked about your own experience of being 61 and still a person of prejudice, that, that song from South Pacific, You've Got to Be Carefully Taught. And I, I wonder if we can dig into that a little bit because you of all people have spent a great deal of time in the black community and have a unique experience of it, you I think. You know, and I remember a bishop coming to me once when I was on the west side and he said, you know, I don't like coming to see you because I uh, have to be careful about what I say because I might end up being called a racist. And I said, Bishop, I said, that's not a bad thing, being careful about what we say. I have to be careful about what I say every day of our lives and it'll be a whole lot better world if more people were careful about what they say. It's important to confess that's right. racism, isn't it? That's right. Deacon Warren on the West Side used to say, you know what, I I've, I've, uh, know there's racism, and he was African American, he said, but I've never met a racist. <laughs> You're right, Lydia. Mike People Ivers, are you are a community organizer. Uh. I mean, you, you walk the streets, you talk the talk, you visit people in need in their homes, and you build a sense of community following the example of Christ. That's right. I try. Authentic discipleship. What have you seen over all these years working in the black community in, in ways of moments of healing, racial healing, and resurrection moments, if you will. No, I, I've seen tremendous human beings reaching out, forgiving people, healing. I've felt so welcome. I was talking to a, a friend of mine the other day who was an intern at St. Agatha. His name is James Walsh. He went to the University of Notre Dame, and he came to visit us at Agatha's, and at the end of the time, I said, well, how did you feel? He says, it was a wonderful experience. I was so welcomed, he said. But you know, Mike, he says, I'm from Ladd, Illinois, LaSalle, Peru. And I couldn't help thinking, what would a person of color be treated like when they came to my hometown? And unfortunately, I think I know the answer. And I just talked to him last night to ask him if I could share you know, this story. And he says, yeah, go ahead. He said, we need to, to tell the truth more and to confess up, as it were. He said, but now he's a, an attorney for the Justice Department, and he's in the Civil Rights Division. And so I see human beings. I haven't done anything, Lydia and Dan. I haven't. People have done things to me transform my life with their love and their witness. God is using you in a special way though, Mike. I mean, talk about Good City, uh, Chicago. How do you seek to combat racism through all the, the linkage of, you know, underemployment, housing, right. uh, well, hunger, right. you know, right. poor health care? Well, we bring people together and racial reconciliation is one of the core values of Good City and of who we are through volunteers, through our board members, through churches, through bringing the programs together. We have a series of workshops, and I always tell them it's not just the information gathered, it's the networking that takes place. And people listen, and they try to make a difference. And we say, whenever you can, you have to be intentional about making a difference and bridging the racial divide. I was just talking with one of our programs, Rob Castaneda of Beyond the Ball, and he was telling, he works in Little Village in North Lawndale, bringing Latino young men from Little Village together with young African-American men. And he says, Mike, you know what? He says, it's really ironic. He says, because really they have more things similar. He said, they have the same tastes, the same music, the same interests, and different skin. But he says, you have to try to bring them together. And he told the story of his wife, who was a kindergarten teacher, and took her class in a Latino public school to the zoo last uh, year. And there was a bus loaded with Asian students, came off, kindergartners. Then a bus, the black students came off. Then a bus, the white students came off, and then her bus, the Latino students came off, and one of the kindergartners pointed to the other kids and said, what are they doing here? And she turned to him and she said, what are you doing here? Well, I'm going to the zoo, so are they. But that motivated her to create a pen pal program with students from her Latino school, with students from an African American school, and they don't even know that they're of a different race. But those are the, an example of the kinds of things that need to take place to interact with people. And, and at the heart of it all is a Christian That's right. sense of calling and ministry, Mike. That's right. That's, That's what I was going to say. Is it a special opportunity for faith communities to step into this community organizing to a certain extent in a really proactive way. Do you well, think? you know, I mean, as Dr. King said, the most segregated time is 11 o'clock on right. Sunday morning. Right. Which is and fascinating I, in this conversation yeah. when you think about it. That's the right. Warner and, Commission said that. That's <laughs> right. And, 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 a, and, a, uh, and a community organizer he was, by right. the way. But I think we have to, churches really need to get up there. And I wrote a poem once called, if it's all white, it's not all right. 
And I think in our churches, we have to see if we're missing uh, diversity in our congregation. We have an opportunity uh, to go ahead and reach out. We have a responsibility and a mandate by the gospel message of Jesus Christ to go out and to become more diverse. What did Jesus do? He went everywhere they told him not to go. He went out to the Samaritan woman. That's what we have to do. If we see that there's a disparity or disconnect as churches, they can come and get involved in the lives of others. How has racism changed over all these years you've been working there? Oh, I don't know. I, I think mean, has how, it. how does it rear its ugly head these days in ways that you can see it? Well, I think, you know, it's, it's very subtle, but it's stronger than ever. And uh, just recently, uh, the American Medical Association apologized uh, for not allowing blacks into the American Medical Association, which was devastating because if you were not there at that time, you couldn't get privileges at hospitals and in other ramifications. And they closed medical schools until there was only Meharry uh, and Howard uh, left. And uh, in 1910, 2.5% of the doctors in this country were African American. In 2008, 2.2% of doctors so are African American. So it's worse. A lot of work for systemic problems. Oh, yes, systemic uh, problems. I've got to ask how you and your wonderful wife, Dr. Greta Ivers, face the challenges of being an interracial couple. Well, it's, uh, it's interesting. People say, Mike, you're always talking about race. You, how do you really often do you have to deal with it? I said, well, since I'm married to a very strong black woman, I said 24 hours a day, and it's still a process. We laugh. Uh, we joke and sometimes we get angry when we experience things. We went to see a play in uh, Broadway called Caroline or Change uh, mm -hmm. and about racial issues and we were walking outside of the uh, play afterwards down Broadway and three white kids came out of a subway and said, hey, what are you, you blankety blank, doing with that blankety blank? And my wife still gives me a hard time for my response. I ran after him and said, what are you doing with that ignorant face? <laughs> and she says, couldn't you have thought a better line? I said, no. But I think uh, it's, it's people will see us together sometimes and, uh, you know, they'll see us walking and talking and then they'll say, can I help you? And then they'll say, turn to me and say, can I help you? And pretend like we're not together. And we think, you know, some people it's just not approving. You know, there's a lot of people who, who disapprove of the races mingling. And it's a shame. It's because this is the way the Lord wants us to be, is to come together as society. But it's important to, to know we can come together and still maintain our own identity and strength. Well, I was going to say in that, that uh, study that you called out about how America's population is really shifting is going to be a fascinating time for us, isn't it? That's when right. the minorities become the majority in many cases. I mean, do you have any... That's right. Well, I encourage people to to just be more intentional. For pastors where their community is all white, you know, get a partnership with a church that's all black. And what I tell people in both congregations and all the different areas, the Latino community, the black community, the white community, the Asian community is, you know what? When we get to heaven, we're going to be surprised at who else is there. <laughs> we may never, oh my goodness, I didn't think they'd get to heaven. And I always tell people, we have to remember that, the, that judgment time, whatsoever we do to the least, that we do unto him. In our final moment, young people, that terrific piece at the top of the show with Reuben Robinson and Prodigal Sons, what are young people, what are their attitudes about race? Well, I have to, I think they're very open, probably a lot more open, and that's why the idea of getting kindergartners involved is important. Uh, Reverend Robinson's young people gave a presentation on the north side that I was facilitating, and five elderly white ladies were sitting in the front row, and it was wonderful to see the smiles and the tears that came to their eyes and how they reached out to them and embraced them. And that's what I'm talking about, taking advantage of those experiences to improve our racial situation in this country. Well, Mike, we so appreciate you joining with us, uh, and the messages that you deliver are always inspiring, full of energy. So thanks for thanks. being here, and come back again, all appreciate right? Appreciate the opportunity. All right.